Thank, thank you, Sybil, for that beautiful introduction and for your extraordinary contribution to our great city and country and for your life's work. Uh, Sybil is not only the mother of four children, some of whom are here today, which is an accomplishment in its, in its own right, but she is also an extraordinary attorney and a true heroine, not only to me, but for thousands of women across uh, the world. She has fought for justice for DES uh, daughters, winning a first ever judgment. And she has litigated and won cases on behalf of women whose health was compromised by the Dawkins Shield and other pharmaceutical products. Uh, let me just say that if I ever needed a lawyer, I would want Sybil on my side. And, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, earlier today, we were, were, were talking to New York uh, law students, and we were talking about a, a number of things, including the outrageous uh, attacks of Rush Limbo on the young law student from uh, Georgetown. Uh, where he proceeded to call her a slut and a prostitute. And I'm not going to say the rest of the things he said because I don't want to repeat them. Look it up on the website. But I'm going to send Sybil an open letter and to the students of New York Law School to back her up to file a slander suit against him. As the leading women lawyer with groundbreaking achievements, uh, I want her to take this on. Because I believe what he's really trying to do is to silence young women from speaking out by attacking them and trying to disgrace them. It is un-American, it is unfair, and we need a good attorney to stop this, and I think Sybil's the person to do that. I, 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 I am thrilled to be here today to uh, really uh, introduce uh, one of my heroes, a, a true um, American trailblazer leader, uh, John Kerry. It is a great honor to have you here today as our luncheon speaker. He is uh, not only an extraordinary leader, an exceptional legislator, and I would say my choice for President of the United States in 2004, and in the Democratic primary, I was the first elected official to come out in support of him. I'm proud to have done it. Everything he stood for is uh, uh, something I believe in, and I can tell you he would never chair a committee meeting in which anyone had to ask, where are the women on women's health? Why are they not here? Why are they not allowed to speak? He's been a great leader on women's rights, human rights, uh, rights and social justice in all areas, and has a distinguished career from the beginnings where he served uh, in the United States uh, Navy during the battles in Vietnam where he was a, a distinguished war hero. He also put criminals behind bars as a prosecutor. And he represented his constituents as an elected official. Uh, he has demonstrated throughout his career intelligence, courage, and commitment. As chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he is a leader on international issues and one of the nation's most respected experts on national security issues and one of the most mentioned names as the most qualified to serve in the future, possibly as Secretary of State. In 2010, in 2010, he led the effort in the Senate to ratify the new START nuclear arms reduction treaty with Russia. Recognizing the risk of nuclear weapons, he fought for ratification of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. He fought against withdrawal from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, and he has also fought for greater accountability, which I think is tremendously important, for nuclear, nuclear material from the Soviet Union, and has funded many efforts to buy up this destructive material so that we know where it is. And I am deeply grateful on a personal level, on behalf of my city and state, for his leadership after 9-11. I, I must also mention the leadership of Ken Feinberg uh, in 9-11. He did such an extraordinary job <laughs> in a very difficult situation. And during that time, uh, uh, John Kerry led the effort along with, uh, in a bipartisan way with Senator McCain 
and uh, others in Congress, myself included, to totally reform our entire intelligence gathering system, to totally reform our whole efforts to protect the homeland, to the greatest reorganization since 1947 in our government, creating the Homeland Security Department, and a whole host of new priorities and port security, airline security, and really made Homeland Security the number one issue concern. We obviously had made some mistakes prior to 9-11. We addressed them in a bipartisan great way, and he was one of the major leaders in making that happen. And since New York is still terrorist target number one, so the FBI tells me, I am deeply grateful for your leadership in this area. Thank you. He is a, a strong advocate for working families, veterans, and small businesses. And we are currently working together on immigration reform and to pass uh, what we call the Startup Visa Act, which will allow the State Department to issue visas to entrepreneurs who will create jobs in the United States. He has also led uh, in assisting small businesses, at, uh, helping them have access to, to capital and seed money to create and expand uh, businesses. And he has been one of the leading voices, along with uh, former Vice President Gore, sounding the alarm about climate change for more than 20 years and has been a proponent of high-tech solutions that could stem the rate of change and recently championed a bipartisan effort to pass comprehen comprehensive climate and energy legislation reform in the Senate. He is also the author of a bestseller, on the environment this moment on earth along with his wife Teresa Hines and uh, I recommend his fine book he is a sane voice a rational and clear voice that our country needs in short he is one great guy he's got a lot of titles he's done a lot of things he's on a lot of boards may I just introduce a really nice guy a friend in New York a friend to our country an outstanding senator an outstanding leader in our country thank you for being here we're so glad you're here thank you bye bye thank you thank you thank you very much thank you, thank you. Thank you all very much. I, I accept the nomination. <laughs> I have to tell you, I haven't, uh, this is deja vu all over again because uh, uh, being with Carolyn and being introduced by her uh, is a great reminder of those wonderful days when I was campaigning here. And I am so grateful to so many people. But Carolyn was indeed one of the first to step up and stand up. and. Uh, I am forever grateful for that, and I have to tell you that uh, uh, her leadership uh, has really been spectacular. Uh, from the, you know, it's not the first time we've heard from her, but that question that she asked, "Where are the women?" was heard across the country, and it helped to turn the course of the debate around, uh, so that uh, yesterday we defeated that horrible amendment in the United States Senate. <laughs> And Carolyn was certainly part of that. Uh, uh, so, Carolyn, thank you for your long-term friendship and leadership. I really appreciate it. Thank you, all of you, for being here. It is really an honor for me to uh, deliver uh, this discussion. I'm not going to call it a lecture. It just sounds so uh, everybody's going to go to sleep. You're going to eat while I'm lecturing you. And I don't want to lecture you. I want to talk with you. Uh, if I may, but I do honor the fact that this is a very special lecture series, and I'm honored to be a part of it. Uh, uh, Sidney Shanewald's remarkable career uh, as the really the you know the person who created consumer awareness and consumerism and consumer accountability and did such an extraordinary job uh, in changing people's attitude about that. And of course, few people do personify that movement more uh, than Sybil, the sponsor of this wonderful event. And so I want to thank her for 30 years. She has been a champion, as you've heard, uh, uh, and her legal career has uh, focused mostly on women's health issues. So it's very appropriate in the sense of the debate that's going on right now that we're here today. Uh, in addition to her writings and testimony, uh, before Congress and the FDA, she's had a huge impact uh, in raising 
the nation's awareness of those issues. And so uh, it's already been mentioned uh, by your chairman of the Board of Trustees that she won that distinguished award, uh, first woman ever to win it in 2007. But Sybil, thank you. What an honor to be here with you, and thank you for all you do. Uh, may I also uh, say, uh, Dean Crowell, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I am uh, honored by the opportunity to be able to share some thoughts at this podium, uh, and uh, even more so because Ken Feinberg, who is an old pal of mine, called me and asked me about this. Uh, and there is a person who personifies public service as much as anybody I've ever met in my life. Ken, uh, he. He really has done it all. Uh, I, I watched him when he was uh, Ted Kennedy's chief of staff. I had the privilege of working with Teddy as a colleague and friend for 26 of the years I've been in the Senate. Uh, uh, I've seen him as a federal prosecutor, uh, court-appointed master in the Agent Orange litigation, which was particularly near and dear to my heart. Uh, special master, as has been mentioned, for the September 11 Victim Compensation Fund, which is no, I mean, none of these tasks are easy, folks. And the reason he keeps getting them is because he keeps performing so brilliantly in helping people in difficult situations to feel satisfied and treated fairly. Uh, it's rare in governance that you get that kind of a streak, and when you have somebody who's batting the way he is, people keep going back to him, so he was the master for the uh, uh, TARP executive compensation after all of that, and administrator of the BP oil spill fund, uh, as well as somehow finding time to be an adjunct professor at six law schools. Uh, and, and somewhere, you know, on the day that he rests, he found time to found a law firm by himself called the Feinberg Group. So uh, he is really one of the great forces in our democratic constellation. And Ken, I am so pleased and happy to be here with you. You are truly a tour de force. Thank you for all you do. Um, so listen, folks, here's the deal. I, I usually don't go for cheap applause, which is why whenever I come to New York, I always tell everybody what a great basketball player Jeremy Lin is. Uh, um, I was not so long ago walking through an airport and some guy fingered me. And I don't know if any of you have been in public life, those of you who are here, when that recognition comes as you're rushing to an airplane and somebody wants to grab you and ask you about how you're going to solve the world's problem and you sort of want to put your eyes down, pretend you didn't see that they saw and you're marching on. This guy gave me no break at all. Hey, you, 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 you. Anybody ever tell you you look like that Kerry guy we sent to Washington? I, I said they tell me that all the time. He says, kind of makes you mad, don't it? <laughs> So I come to you with huge humility. I understand that we are at 8% in the United States Congress. And it is therefore miraculous that you have invited a sitting elected member of the United States Senate to come and talk to you. Uh, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. And I want to talk to you in a very serious way about uh, where we find ourselves at this moment in our country. Uh, Most Americans are pretty derogatory, if not outright right, hostile towards uh, public officials, particularly the United States Congress today. And it would be stupid for me to come here and have the privilege of sharing with you some thoughts in a, in a lecture series like this and not just lay it out the way it is. I don't come here to be partisan. But I'm going to tell you facts. And I want you to measure those facts and make your judgments about public life today and what we're going to have to do to put our country back on track. Uh, as you saw yesterday, day before, Olympia Snow, terrific United States Senator, was driven to the point of exhaustion with the process. 
by a caucus and a process that demanded an orthodoxy of performance and belief that she simply was unwilling to kowtow to. And so we've lost another moderate, another person for whom compromise was not a bad word, another person for whom consensus building was a legitimate enterprise and a reason to be in public life. And the Senate and the country are worse off for losing uh, somebody of this quality. And typically, most of the debate and most of the things you hear about in Washington on television are sort of, you know, the, 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 the normal who's up, who's down questions. You know, how is this going to affect the election? How is this going to affect who controls the United States Senate? Uh, what does this mean for the majority and the minority? Not what does this mean about the country and where we are today in terms of our politics. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that because I'm fearful for our country, not because the American people aren't up to the task, but because we're mired in a moment where ideology and, and as our own extremism, our own ideological extremism, and we spend a lot of time talking about other countries, particularly in the Middle East and places where there's a lot of religious excessive demand, but here in our own country we have our own fundamentalists and we have our own excesses of demand today and expectation with respect to the towing of a line. Uh, and so I think we have to think really carefully about where we're heading and what it is doing to the nation. I served on the super committee. I did so as a volunteer, I did so willingly recognizing the dangers and the pitfalls. But I did so because I really believe that this is a moment, this was a moment, where the country had an opportunity to be able to uh, restore confidence to the American people about the ability of the system to make tough decisions. And I believe that it was a moment where we needed to do that because one of the things that's holding us back is the absence of confidence the lack of confidence in the marketplace that comes from a lack of confidence of people who decide where to put money, big sums of money, who aren't convinced that the body politic of the nation is prepared to make the tough choices that that money will be protected. And so we are holding ourselves back on many different fronts at a time where I think America is sort of ready to burst out and go out in a resurgence of entrepreneurial energy and possibility and take the world by storm. We're standing in our own way. And let me be very explicit. There are several exhibits of that. I could go through a long, long list, much longer than we have time to be able to talk about here today. But let me begin with something as prosaic as infrastructure. It's not a great word. It's hard to find a replacement for it. And sometimes my staff kills me when I go out and talk about combined sewer overflow or you know, <laughs> some of these wonderful concepts. But let me tell you something. That's how you build a country. That's how our parents and our grandparents built this country for us. And when you drive out on Robert Moses's work product out here, Tribro and you know, the Great Bridges, or the George Washington, or the Lincoln, or you know, any of the tunnels, or when you use the MBTA up in Boston, or, or you know, go from New York to uh, Washington on the train, all these things, we didn't build them. And we're barely keeping them up. We're living off the investment of our parents and grandparents. And we need to ask ourselves what we're prepared to leave for our children. You know that train, the Acela, that goes, many of you may have ridden it. It can go 150 miles an hour. Did you know that? It only goes 150 miles an hour for 18 miles of the trip between Washington and Boston. Why? Washington and New York. Why? Because if it goes too fast over the bridges of the Chesapeake, it will wind up in the Chesapeake. Because if it goes too rapidly under the bridge, under the tunnel of Baltimore, the vibrations may shake so badly that the tunnel caves in. Meanwhile, 
China is investing $350 billion in the last year in infrastructure, another $240 billion over the next year or two. Uh, Mexico put about uh, $240 billion in infrastructure. Brazil invested $350 billion in the last four years and is going to put another $250 billion in the next few years. And here we are witnessing China putting 9% of GDP into infrastructure, Europe putting 5% of GDP into infrastructure, and the United States of America is putting less than 2% into infrastructure. Even though the experts, the highway and, and road and, and, and public architects tell us that just to keep the United States up to snuff, we would have to spend $250 billion a year for the next 40 years even as we struggle now in our third week on a highway bill that might summon up some 30 plus million billion dollars. Folks, it doesn't work. The United States of America is spending less than 2% of GDP on infrastructure, despite everybody telling us that another bridge may fall into the Mississippi or another road may fall apart on us. We don't even have the next generation of air control system in place yet because we're not investing in our future now. Is the, are we preordained to do that? The country that explored space and created technology and invented solar and wind? No, we're not preordained. That's not our destiny. That's the consequence of the absence of willpower and the absence of people engaging in the political process and holding it accountable and demanding that people do more than simply offer stupid six-word bromides of slogans in political campaigns and pretend that that's adequate to the task. Now, I have proposed, and I have Republican support for this, K. Bailey Hutchinson, Senator Lindsey Graham, South Carolina. We've put together an infrastructure bank bill. It is geared and carefully tailored to address all of the conservative uh, uh, reservations that exist about the potential of another government entity of some kind sponsored by the government. It is incidentally, incidentally totally independent. It will be an independent entity. In order to avoid the consequences of a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, we have made it not giving grants, loans only, loans only for revenue producing projects in energy or in water or in transportation loans that will repay themselves and so that the fund itself will become self-financing. And to prevent any potential for any kind of abuse like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, it will not issue stock and it will not be for profit. For $10 billion of investment, we could excite $650 billion of infrastructure investment in the United States, each billion dollars producing somewhere between a low of 27,000 and a high of 35,000 jobs for Americans. Work the math on that. 600 billion, each billion worth 35,000 or so jobs. You're talking 20 million plus jobs over the next 10 years. We don't have to be an unemployed nation. We don't have to be sitting around struggling the way we are today with the deficit. But we're not witnessing a Congress or a country that is prepared to embrace real decisions. Energy. Energy is a $6 trillion market. That's what's waiting out there. China gets it. China's going to spend three to one over us next year on clean energy projects. The United States of America invented solar technology. We invented wind turbine technology. We did it at the Bell Labs 50 years ago. A few years ago, 5% of the solar panels of the world were being built in China. Today, as we're here, over 65% are being built in China. And the United States doesn't have one company, the country that invented the technology doesn't have one company in the top 10 in the world. And because of the gridlock in Congress, we have not renewed the tax incentives that are in place for wind and solar, 1603 program, and therefore, there will be no new startups in the United States next year for wind and turbine technology. They're gonna be laying off people, folks unless people get their act together. We don't even have an energy grid in the United States of America. 
We have a great big gaping hole in the center of the country. We have a grid in the East Coast. We have a grid on the West Coast. We have a grid in Texas that has its own grid. And then you have a sliver of a line that goes from Chicago out towards the Dakotas. And a gaping hole in the middle. So you can't produce solar thermal clean energy down in Arizona and sell it in Minnesota or North Dakota when it's cold and where they could use it and produce electricity cheaper. You can't sell wind power from the Cape in Massachusetts to the South and so forth. This is absurd. And we profess to be a modern nation and a, and a world leader. Well, let me just tell you, the World Economic Forum has just come out with its latest report on competitiveness among the G20 countries. We have once again, for the third year in a row, been downgraded. We have gone from first, and we are now fifth among the G20 countries, and on the slide, because we don't invest in infrastructure, because we won't be smart, because we don't build an energy grid, because of, you know, education. Uh, Two-thirds of the jobs that are going to be produced in America, according to a study by Georgetown University, are going to be uh, requiring, two-thirds are going to be requiring college graduates. And we have gone from number one in the world in the number of our citizens who are graduating from college to number 16. In 1970, 50 percent of all of our college, of all of the uh, uh, engineering and science degrees held by anybody were held by the United States of America, by our citizens. Today it has dropped to 15 percent. The world is changing. And we're not changing with it. We're going backwards. We're going into this kind of crazy uh, ideological ozone layer. It, it's bizarre. Uh, you know, where we're seeing a presidential race on the other side that is, uh, uh, you know, a traveling reality gong show television. <laughs> it's bizarre. I mean, we're just not, we're not coping with anything real. Leading candidate on their side has offered what for the economy of our country? A 20% tax cut. Well, let me say something about that for a minute. I served, as I mentioned a moment ago, on that super committee. I had real hopes, not a deep belief, but real hopes that we could get a deal. Why? Because the country needs a deal, desperately. Because we're borrowing 40 cents of every dollar that we're spending. Because we're revenues today are currently at 15% of GDP. While spending is at about 23 or 4%, neither is sustainable. Spending is at a 60 year high. Revenues are at a 60 year low. Now, the three groups that have tried to cope with this thus far were the Simpson-Bowles Commission, the Rivland Domenici Commission, and the bipartisan Gang of Six in the Senate sitting there today. Three Republicans, three Democrats, all of whom agreed that the only way to deal with the deficit sustainable issue and put America on track and do this in a balanced way so that we don't cut growth but we continue to, be, to put some austerity in place. The only way to do it was to do it by a fair balance. Every one of those groups I just mentioned said you have to get a four trillion dollar deal and in reductions, two trillion of it coming from revenue, two trillion of it coming from Cuts. That's fair. That's what we tried to do. On the Super Committee, we actually went farther than that. We, we, we said, you know what, we know the Republicans are in a tough place, and I, I'm not here to be partisan, but I'm just telling you the facts here. We know they've got Grover Norquist out there. We know it's going to be difficult. Let's offer, so we negotiated with ourselves for the opening hand. And we didn't go for two trillion. We offered them 1.3 trillion of revenue, thinking, this is a really fair way to start. Rejected within hours. Too much revenue. We can't do 1.3 trillion of revenue. Well, guess what, my friends? We balanced the budget four times in the 1990s. And when we balanced the budget four times in the 1990s in a bipartisan way, 
we had 21% of GDP revenue. 21% of, uh, the, of, 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 of was revenue to GDP. It was at 21%. That's how we balanced it. <clears throat> and we had a surplus at the end of that. You all remember, to, to $5.6 trillion surplus was handed to George W. Bush. In fact, Alan Greenspan was complaining that we were paying down the debt too fast. So we all know what happened. I'm not going to go through the in-betweens except to summarize it by saying we had two credit card wars and two credit card tax cuts, neither of which were affordable or ever paid for. And yes, we went into a big deficit. Not hard to understand. So here we are today trying to say, how do we deal with it? Well, guess what? If your revenues are at 15% of GDP, and you're spending, you got to come at it both ways. And that's what we tried to do, but oh no. They wouldn't take 1.3 trillion. Then we went down to 1 trillion. They wouldn't take 1 trillion. We went to 950, because they said, you got to get that T word out of there. If you get the T word out of there, we might be able to do it. Oh, we took the T word out of there. And guess what? We got an N word, no. <laughs> and so we went to 650. No, too much revenue. Our guys will never go for 650 revenue. Finally, Pat Toomey, senator from Pennsylvania, offered up 350 billion in revenue that would come by changing deductions, limiting the deductions for the wealthiest 1% of Americans, and that way we would get more revenue. Well, 350 doesn't get you very far when you're trying to do 4 trillion, and everybody else has said you need 2 trillion. So our guys said, we're not going to cut Medicare, Medicaid, and do all these other hard things for 350 billion. You know, we'll do some. So that's where we were. On the final day, I offered them, I want you to hear what I offered them. I offered them on behalf of our, uh, us Democrats, a deal. Their problem was they wanted the Bush tax cuts to be made permanent. That was their biggest bottom line red line of negotiation. And, and that included the upper 1%. You have to continue the Bush tax cut for the upper 1%. Well, you can't balance the budget if you do that. You can't get there. You can't take it all out of just 12% of the budget, which is discretionary. So I came to them and I said, look, let's, let's do something for the country. Let's offer America the vision of a committee that actually was successful. Let's show the people that we could come together and at least avoid sequester. At least put in front of them the 1.2 trillion reduction. That's the bottom line that avoids sequester. And here's how we do it. You've offered 350 billion in, in your Pat Toomey's proposal. We'll take it. And we'll provide the difference in the 1.2 trillion by doing what we have to do with entitlements, Medicaid, Medicare, with some tough things we were prepared to do in order to be successful. But we went further than that. We offered them the following. We said, look, you want the Bush tax cuts made permanent. We, we don't. If we're not going to agree on that, why don't we at least for the sake of success agree simply to postpone that decision? Let's guarantee you a vote on the Bush tax cuts next December. Right now, this December of this year, it would have been. And we will send tax instructions to the committee, the tax committees. We will send them instructions that require to hold the individual tax rate in America at 34%, lower than it is today, done by broadening the base, obviously, getting rid of some of the deductions. And on the corporate side, we will offer America a 25% corporate rate and deal with the repatriation of our funds from abroad so that we can get our economy moving and excite the nation. All you have to do is agree to vote on that and we'll give you expedited procedure, no filibuster possible, and we'll even give you an even Stephen number of people on the conference committee so the fact that we're in the majority in the Senate can't jam you. How fair can you be? And they said no. And do you know why they said no? Because of Grover Norquist and the pledge and the fact that they'd had this pushback from their base on even what Pat Toomey had offered and they were afraid in the end that the upper 1% might be exposed to double jeopardy of attacks 
if we didn't get rid of the tax cut at the end of the year. So you know where we are today? We're cruising towards this collision at the end of the year. And if something isn't done, the taxes are going to go up on every American on December 31st of this year when the Bush tax cuts automatically expire. Well, that actually gives me hope, and I want to end on an up note, hopeful note here. I believe that because of this dynamic, this, this tax sword of Damocles holding o over our head this end of this year, I think once this election is done and people have seen the fundamental bankruptcy of going back to the same old, same old proposals, and we get through the election, I believe we're going to be in a position to actually change what is happening in the Congress. And I want to just talk about that for a moment and end up here. Why are we stuck? Why is this the way it is today? Why does Olympia Snow leave? Why are we gridlocked the way we are on this energy program or on infrastructure or anything constructive? Well, I'll tell you in very simple terms. Certain people in the leadership in the United States uh, Congress have made a decision that their primary objective is not fixing the economy, it is defeating this president. And they have decided to do everything possible to gridlock everything in order that we all look bad and then people throw everybody out and they'll come into power. It's the most depressingly uh, small-minded, venal, uh, you know, unpatriotic kind of thing I've ever seen in my life. But it's real. What I'm saying is real. You can go back and read the quote of Mitch McConnell, who not once but twice on national television said his primary objective was making sure Barack Obama was a one-term president. Despite the fact, incidentally, that the stock market has had a 90% increase since March of 2009, 3.6 million jobs have been created, TARP has been paid back, General Motors is now the largest manufacturer of automobiles in the world, and you can run down a long list of pluses all of which have been done against the greatest obstructionism that I have ever seen in the history of the United States Congress. In the 19th century, there were something like 20 total filibusters in the entire century. Between 1933 and World War II, there were two filibusters. In the 60s, there were three or four, uh, Civil Rights Bill, uh, a couple of others, Voting Rights Act. Today, we have over a hundred filibusters every session. Just to get a judge approved, they force us to go through the counter filibuster procedure. The average now of days now to get a federal judge approved is 136 days from the day they're reported out of the committee until the day they finally voted on the floor of the Senate. Under George Bush, it was 30 days. And when we finally get the vote on these judges, it's 100 to nothing, or 98 to 2. It's delay for the sake of delay, for the sake of obstructionism, all at the expense of the larger choices that our nation faces. So I, I just say to all of you, I, I, uh, this has to change, obviously. But you're the ones who are going to have to help us change it. That's really what it comes down to. I hear people complaining and saying, God, Congress is broken. Uh, the, 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 you know, we've got to change the rules, this and that. Folks, we're operating under the same rules we operated under when Tip O'Neill cut deals. These are the same rules we had when Trent Lott and George Mitchell and Bob Dole and Tom Daschle and people made deals. This is the same rules we had when we balanced the budget in the 1990s. It's not the rules. It's the people. It's the people and part of the process outside of the Congress. Citizens United is the single most destructive decision since Dred Scott. And it is threatening our democracy. And ever since I came to Congress, I've been passionate about the need to change the financing of our campaigns. But even more so today than ever before, the agenda of our nation is being stolen by those who choose to participate with large sums of money, and obviously that's the people who have the money. And the vast majority of America is, you know, can participate through the internet, and they do, thank God, to a certain degree. But when you see tens of millions and hundreds of millions spent the way it's being spent to distort the agenda and the process, we're all in trouble. So I close by saying to you that uh, 
you know, consumer interests, citizen interests, our nation's interests. This is as critical as any time I've ever seen it. As chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, I travel a lot, obviously. I am seeing a difference in the way leaders are talking to us now. And I've talked at length with Secretary Clinton about this, and she agrees completely. Our leverage is altered by this. People look at us and wonder. I've had people ask me, well, if we were to do this, how do we know you can deliver? How do we know Congress is going to get it done? Even on Iran, this is affecting some judgments in the Middle East about what we're able to get people to agree to. And there are other people who look at us now and they say, this is, I tell you, it's affected the conversation in Pakistan and Afghanistan, where openly people say, well, the United States is withdrawing now. They're going to they're reduce their presence in the world and they're in the decline. I have heard those words. The United States is in the decline. And, you know, the ascendancy, China, India, Brazil, Mexico, South Korea, where they're raging ahead without this kind of political ideological gridlock. Thank, thank you, Sybil, for that beautiful introduction and for your extraordinary... And we've got to change what we're doing and bring this accountability to the table. And I think you know, it's appropriate in the context of, a, of, of, of Sydney's life and what it stood for in terms of consumer and consumer empowerment because really we have the power. We don't exercise it very well. The truth is, uh, you know, in 1970 when I came back from Vietnam, the first thing I did was not protest the war. It was in fact become involved in Earth Day. And 20 million Americans came out of their homes and said, we don't want to see the... You know, lo I love canals and so forth. And so those 20 million people did more than just come out. They translated it into political power. They organized. And production and for your extraordinary contribution to our great city and country and for your life's work. Uh, Sybil is not only... Seven of the 12 lost their seats. So what happened? Every survivor started to quake and say, whoops, this environmental thing has voting power. And all of a sudden we passed the Clean Air Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Coastal Zone Management Act, and we created the EPA. We didn't even have an EPA in America. Remember, this is only X number of eight, ten years after Rachel Carson wrote The Silent Spring. This was new. And we made it happen. Now, big money comes in and prevents us from taking coal-fired power plants offline or holding people accountable in global climate change. People don't even want to believe the science and so forth. So that's why fighting back is so critical. And as you contemplate how you're going to do it and why it is so important in these next months, uh, I just want you to remember this is not a new fight. In the 1800s, when Ben Franklin walked out of that hall in Philadelphia and walked down the steps late at night, when they had finished their grinding work on writing the Constitution for our nation and deciding what we would be. A woman came up to him on the steps, and it is recorded, and she looked at him and she said, tell us, Dr. Franklin, what do we have? A monarchy or a republic? And he looked at her and he said, a republic, if you can keep it. That's our mission. Thank you all very, very much. Civil asked me to sort of lead any discussion. We've only got about because of the effusive praise of the senior set of professors. We only have time for about two questions. So well, we'll try and get a couple in. I got to get a flight back to Washington, but we'll get as many as we can quickly. So we got some time. So who's up? We'll go fast, and I'll try to give a quick answer, and we'll go for there. Yes. I, I, I have hopes and I can't predict today. I mean, it'll be a hard-fought race. And, um, uh, you know, uh, I think it would be helpful if 75% of my votes weren't canceled out by my own colleague in my own state. Over here. Uh, yes.
I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Which, which bill? Oh, endocrine disruption, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how, how many, I, we put, we have, talk about needing Sydney and this kind of effort. We have about 80,000 plus chemicals that are in the American marketplace. Only about 6,000 of them have been vetted by the FDA. So when you go buy some of your skin cream or your shampoo or different kinds of things, I got, I got news for you folks. Uh, some of this discussion is in our book, uh, and my wife, Teresa, is, really knows a lot about this. She's spent a lot of time with Carnegie Mellon scientists and uh, different folks digging into it. Um, but these, they're, they're just huge burden. It's called the body burden that people bear as a consequence of chemicals that are floating around in the atmosphere or in food or in, you know, we have mercury in fish and so on and so forth. And uh, there was an interesting analysis recently that showed uh, that the placenta of uh, new mothers uh, had something like 130 different chemicals in it that just didn't belong there. And, and so endocrine disruptors are, are come, they are these invasions that enter your body and actually interfere with the normal uh, function of your body in ways that is having a profound impact, uh, people think, on, for instance, the sperm count in men, which is going down in America. Uh, and on other, you know, cancers and other kinds of things which affects the ways your cells are normally supposed to operate. So it, it's, it's a really serious deal and a lot of, you know, we, we, there's a lot we don't know about of what we put on our skin, which is an organ of your body. In fact, it's the biggest organ that covers your body. So what you put on your skin uh, can have a profound impact ultimately because it's absorbed, as you know. Sometimes you're given medicine to take that way. Well, everything else you put on, therefore, gets taken in. And you've got to think about it. There are a lot of things I'm not familiar with all of them that are out there in the marketplace that are really uh, dangerous to people. Um, and, um, and so we're, we're, we're trying to raise awareness about it in this legislation, which has yet to come out of committee. Uh, and we've got to raise people's awareness. And, and we're working on it. Frank Lautenberg is very helpful on it. He's terrific. He gets it and understands it. And some of my other colleagues are really focused on this. But it is, it is a major concern. If you want to talk about reducing health care costs in America, here is a brilliant way to do it. And there's much more we can do in prevention, frankly, that would have a much more salutary impact on, on health in America. But that's where the endocrine disruptor issue is going to grow. You're all going to hear about it. It's going to become people will be more and more aware of it. And, and it's one of the big things we could do to help prevent cancer and reduce the expenditures on cancer. Yes. <clears throat> well, let me, let me say something about that. Um, and some of you will not like what I say. Some of you uh, may appreciate it, I hope. But I am, I am pro-choice, and I have voted pro-choice all my life in the Senate. Uh, and, uh, but I don't like the way the debate is, is structured in America. And I saw this firsthand as I went around the country uh, running for president. And, and I think all of us need to be thoughtful and sensitive about our language and how we frame the argument about it. Um, to simply say it's their body and dismiss that as the ultimate answer with respect to the argument, I don't think actually does full justice to the complexity of the issue. And I think when you look at the issue of the Supreme Court decision and analyze Roe v. Wade and, and start thinking about this, this critical component of the Griswold case, of privacy and of other cases, is this issue of viability. Viability is critical and science is narrowing the viability window. Everybody needs to understand that. So I think that you, you, you need to, uh, 
I think it's important for us to recognize that it's not just one person all the way through. For instance, third trimester and or partial birth abortion issues, things like that, very complicated. And, and so I think that, that the way the court has defined it in Roe v. Wade is frankly the most sensitive and thoughtful and best way to be talking about it uh, because it recognizes that there is in some instances certainly, and it depends on your own belief system, it depends on what kind of life and when you think life exists and where it exists. Some people have a tortured choice with respect to this issue because they do believe there's something living inside of them may not be a fully defined person yet, et cetera, not a born person. So people draw di different distinctions about all of that. But I do think that it is, it is not simply as simple as saying you can do whatever you want with your body. And it depends on what stage it is and what else is at stake here. That said, I do think it is absolutely inappropriate for the government uh, to be dictating things that go well beyond what the Supreme Court has articulated. And uh, I think we are fighting for the right thing. And contraception is a very different thing from all of that. Uh, contraception we settled a long time ago. And the notion that in America, you know, insurance policies ought to pay for Viagra, uh, but they're not gonna pay for contraception, which 99% of women use is absolutely idiocy. And uh, that's what we fought against in winning this amendment the other day. A couple more maybe, and then we gotta go. I'm getting the message, I gotta go. Last question, have to be the last, folks, because I gotta get back. Uh, Secretary, thank you for coming on screen here. Uh, young enthusiastic supporter of our country, Arabian political system. What do you recommend that some young people who are turned off to politics because of the current political climate in Washington? What, what can I tell young people to try to inspire them again? Well, here's, here's what you gotta tell them. Look, we still have the greatest amount of freedom of any people on the face of the planet. We have the greatest ability to go out and say we don't like something and not get thrown in jail for it and actually go out and organize door to door and house to house. And the reason we got the president we got, who I think has made some of the toughest and most important decisions of any president in the last, you know, 60, 70 years since Franklin Roosevelt, uh, I, the reason we got that is frankly because a lot of young people went to work and did it. There isn't any campaign I've ever been part of in America where young people haven't made the difference not in terms of the environment movement, the women's movement, the peace movement, not in any election. Young people make the difference. And, they, and the important thing is to remind people how much power they in fact have. You know, the power of youthful energy and idealism and time and the willingness to live on peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for a few months and you know, the, uh, live in a house with 20 other people while you're campaigning in Iowa or something. It's a great privilege and a great opportunity. And I think you just have to encourage people that people, in the end, are, are, are the antidote, even to the money. If you have enough people knocking on doors and you have enough people telling the truth, they can't spend enough money on their lives. So that's the antidote and that's how you reclaim the country, frankly, and the future. Folks, I gotta run. I thank you. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate it.